Welcome everyone to our uh, official second uh, board meeting of the uh, new Austin P Board of Trustees. I guess we're not necessarily new anymore since this is our second meeting, but welcome to everybody that's here. Um, at this time, we will call the roll. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins. Here. Trustee Kanata. Here. Trustee Carroll. Here. Trustee <clears throat> Jenkins. Here. Trustee Luck. Here. Trustee May. Here. Trustee Mueller. Here. Trustee O'Malley. Here. Trustee Rayburn. Here. Trustee Willenius. Here. Uh, sounds like we have a quorum. Um, I move for adoption of the agenda. Is there a second? second? Trustee Luck seconds the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The agenda is adopted. The minutes were circulated in advance of the meeting. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Hearing no corrections, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, Trustee Rayburn moves to approve the minutes. Is there a second? A second. Trustee Jenkins seconds the motion. All in favor by, of approving the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So the minutes are adopted. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize President White, who will introduce Dwayne Estes to provide us with a camp. What we're going to do each, each meeting going forward is to give you a little bit of an introduction about something going on on campus so that each year you'll have four presentations to get you a little bit more familiar with things that are going on. And I'm really excited today to bring someone to you who is, is really an Austin P. rock star. Dr. Dwayne Estes is an associate professor of biology. He is a biodiversity explorer attached to the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, which has a, a national and actually international reputation. He is a principal investigator for the Center for Excellence in Field Biology here at Austin P. and also is the director of the APSU Herbarium. And I would just say he is an evangelist for uh, biodiversity, and I'm delighted to ask him to come and just share an in initiative that will have a great impact on this university and on our state going forward. Dr. Estes. Well, thank you all for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm um, excited to come and, and be uh, or evangelize a little bit about biodiversity with you this morning. So, well, uh, let me tell you guys a story you probably never heard anything about. And uh, it's a story that's near and dear to my heart. It's a new initiative that we're proud to, uh, to launch here at Austin Peay called the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative, protecting, restoring, and rebuilding the forgotten grasslands of the South. I'm going to tell you first about a guy named Tommy Johns. Uh, Tommy Johns was my sixth grade Tennessee history teacher. I grew up in Giles County, Tennessee, and in 1990, he had the privilege of paddling me 13 times, uh, all for talking too much. And I'm sure he'd probably be in jail today, but um, in any case, um, that was, a, that was a, a really cool experience in that the one academic thing I do remember of course, I'm kidding about Mr. Johns. Uh, the one academic thing I do remember from that class, however, was him telling this really fanciful story about how the forests of Tennessee were so dense at the time of European settlement that a squirrel could go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River without touching the ground. And I remember marveling at that. And the forest behind my house had big trees, and it was easy for me to, to see that in my mind. And I want to really quick call your attention to that one photo on the right. That's a photo from Western North Carolina around 1900 that shows uh, virgin American chestnut trees. And so you can kind of get an image of then what uh, I think most of us picture when we think about Eastern United States in, say, 1750. What we didn't learn about in Mr. Johns' class and didn't learn about in any college class was America's grasslands, specifically Tennessee's grasslands. We don't think about Tennessee as being a prairie state, but it's as much a prairie state as Kansas is, in fact. So let me read to you this, uh, this quote, which is one of my favorite. It would be difficult to imagine anything more beautiful, for as far as the eye could reach, they seem one vast deep green meadow, adorned with countless numbers of bright flowers, springing up in all directions, and only a few clumps of trees, now and then a solitary post oak, were to be seen. Here I first saw the prairie bird or barren hen. 
Here the wild strawberries grew in such profusion as to stain the horse's hooves a deep red color. That quote is not from South Dakota and it's not from Kansas. It's from about 10 miles north of where we sit today from 1812 by Reuben Ross, one of Clarksville's earliest and most influential settlers. And that photograph, in fact, is also not the Nebraska Sandhills. That's Fort Campbell Army Base's Sook John Drop Zone. That remains the largest open prairie left in Tennessee with the exception of the base's impact zone. The base's impact zone, uh, which is 25,000 contiguous acres is the largest, and that's, uh, excuse me, is the largest open prairie left in the eastern United States. The barren hen or prairie uh, is the prairie chicken that today is only found in parts of Kansas and the, the Dakotas, but was here up until about the time that Ross wrote this, this uh, exceptional description. So uh, the grasslands that we don't know anything about are basically in, two, in three categories in terms of their states of conservation. There are those today that are relatively secure, as they were 300 years ago. The summit of Roan Mountain in, in the northeast corner of the state is a, a great example of a grassland that's still relatively intact. We have those that are restorable, such as uh, what Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency is doing on the Cumberland Plateau, opening up large areas like at Catoosa Wildlife Management Area's uh, 3,000 acre savanna project, for example. We can go in and clear some of those forests and take them back to what the early description said they were in the, in the 1790s, for example. And so that's how you can see in the lower right how they've opened up some of those forests to go back to savanna. But then we have the case that Montgomery County falls into, which are functionally extinct grasslands. They're gone. They were never photographed. They were never painted. And they were largely never described by the first naturalist. And so by the time the Civil War came, they were gone. And they have been erased from our collective historical memory as a society. And so in 1922, Shull wrote, the barons are only a memory. So what we lost basically in Montgomery County, and this is one of many examples across the southeast, is we lost a grassland the size of Connecticut and Rhode Island, some 3.7 million acres. And all we're left with now are sacred gems, little tiny remnants to remind us of the past. But you've got to be a pretty well trained expert to be able to recognize those remnants. Places like Baker Prairie in Arkansas, Suther Prairie near Chapel Hill, North Carolina, stunning examples of what used to be. So can we afford to let our last remnants slip into oblivion? And so if we look at rare habitat types across the south, uh, things like quail, for example, need certain types of habitats. If we look across the southeast, there are 1,213 rare habitat types recognized by NatureServe and many other uh, organizations. Half of those are types of grasslands. When we consider rare plants, just as an example, here in Tennessee we have 440 species of plants that are considered rare. 60% uh, of those need grasslands. And if we look at animals, 34% in Tennessee need grasslands. Last year, Conservation International, an international conservation group, uh, recognized the southeastern United States as the world's newest 36th global biodiversity hotspot. That places us on par now with places like the Himalayas, the Mexican Highlands, the Atlantic Forest of Brazil, etc. And that designation came because of our grassland component. It's uh, shocking to many, but there are more species of grassland plants and animals in the southeast than the entire Great Plains of the U.S. and Canada combined. So what's happened since we've lost these great grasslands? We've look at, we're looking at basically total ecological collapse. By 1815, we lost bison and prairie chickens. Uh, by the 1960s, we lost most of these other small critters. These are warning signs, but today we're waking up because we see things that we like to hunt that are disappearing, <coughs> Bob White quail being foremost among them. And so it's projected that in 12 years that uh, Bob White quail will diminish by half, and that in uh, seven years after that, so basically by the year 2035, 2036, <coughs> we're looking at half of that population again being cut in half. So that by 2050, we're looking at the extinction of Bob White. And so now, thanks to Bob White, and also the fact that monarch butterflies have declined by 80% in the last 10 years, uh, the conservation community is beginning to stand up and take notice and realize the importance of our grassland and other open habitat type communities. And so organizations and agencies like NRCS, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here in Tennessee, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, are beginning to pour a lot of money in terms of contracts into trying to figure out this problem. 
So the question is, can our grasslands survive into the 22nd century? I don't think they can. There's too many hurdles that are in their future. And so until there's a coordinated effort to conserve, research, and rebuild them, they will continue to slip into oblivion. And quail will go extinct. And so will the meadowlark and the other birds that used to sing so commonly up until the 1980s. Saving our grasslands is going to require extraordinary efforts. There is no effort currently ongoing that will save them. It's going to require something greater than what we've seen. And so we're proposing that there needs to be an unparalleled long-term commitment from philanthropy especially and grants secondarily. We need support at local, regional, state, and national levels. This includes political support. We need leadership and we need coordination. We need investments in infrastructure and organization. And we need a multifaceted response. And so in doing so, the objectives of the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative will be to uh, serve as a, a clearinghouse so that we lead excellence in research here at Austin P. Uh, we provide leadership in education, as we do with the Center of Excellence for Field Biology. Uh, we provide sound consultation to places like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Wildlife Refuge System. And we want to become a granting program. We want to be the place where people, say, from the Kentucky Nature Preserves Commission can come to us and ask us for $25,000 to do a conservation project because they can't get it anywhere else. So we want to be that source. And so our focal region covers 22 states. It's a big area. We've excluded the Great Plains, we've excluded the Midwestern Tallgrass Prairie, and we've excluded the Southern Pine Savannas to focus on the forgotten grasslands of the South, which extend from Austin, Texas, to Philadelphia, up to the glacial boundary in Illinois, and down to Tallahassee, Florida. We are um, excited to announce that we are uh, forming partnerships with, um, uh, of course, Austin P. Leadership uh, leading this effort. We have the Botanical Research Institute of Texas in Fort Worth. We have the North Carolina Botanical Garden, which is part of UNC Chapel Hill. And just yesterday, the University of Georgia State Botanical Garden uh, announced in a meeting in Chattanooga that they also want to partner with us. So SGI will again serve as a clearinghouse. And uh, what we anticipate, the model is that through philanthropic contributions, uh, for example, we've already been endorsed by the Band Foundation out of Washington, DC. They've uh, given us a small planning grant uh, but they are looking to give us between one and 1.5 million at the end of this year, hopefully. So, but there's some things that we need to do to be able to ensure that that happens. Um, we're also looking to corporate sponsorships. And so there's a number of uh, um, corporations that we're uh, courting, and then hopefully some of these will, will work out. But none of these have been formalized yet. Uh, we're also uh, actively pursuing grants. Uh, we've received two NSF grants and some uh, other contracts along the way. So just to kind of sum up in the last slide here, uh, what we've been working on for the past few months. So again, we do have an endorsement from the, from the Band Foundation. They're helping us to connect to other foundations. So we, our goal this year by October, November is $6 million. So I'll be traveling to Chicago in a couple weeks to meet with the Bobolink Foundation uh, that was established by Henry and Wendy Paulson. Uh, they have the Grasslands of America program. So we're hopeful that they will take interest in this project. Uh, we are also uh, looking for regional partners in addition to core sponsors. So we'll be traveling to Virginia to meet with the Ward Burton Foundation. Uh, we've already been uh, working with a couple of uh, philanthropic entities in North Carolina, uh, one of whom has invited us to submit a proposal for a quarter million dollars. Uh, we have an alumni connection uh, here at Austin P to the Turner Foundation that through uh, Vice President Vandermeer we're going to be uh, hopefully touching base with. We've met with the Lyndhurst Foundation in Chattanooga. They've been very receptive, uh, and they have agreed to introduce us to other foundations in the region. Out in Texas and Oklahoma, we uh, ha have a, a presentation to give to the Samuel uh, Robert Noble Foundation, and we've already went to Oklahoma City to present directly to the Kirkpatrick Foundation. Uh, and there's a few others uh, that we'll be pursuing in uh, Arkansas region and West Tennessee, uh, tackling this from a regional approach. And then finally, just this past week, we've secured some contacts in Nashville who are going to, who have offered to help us reach out to local Nashville-based foundations. And then again, we are still maintaining those attempts to uh, work with some corporate connections. So uh, in closing, uh, these will be uh, added to the ongoing efforts we've been working on now in the Center for Field Biology for a decade or more to connect to local, state, and federal agencies. And uh, all this is going to be imperative if we want to save this, the grasslands of the South and reverse the tide of grassland biodiversity loss. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And of course, I was just kidding about Mr. John. So, all right. Thank you very much.
so far. It's a very worthy uh, cause. I'm a bird watcher myself, so I, I take a, a side interest as well. So Absolutely. congratulations on what you've done so far, and good luck. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, this time I'd like to introduce uh, Donnell Whiteside uh, to explain some proposed amendments to the bylaws. Thank you. So at the last meeting, you all approved bylaws, which which allowed you to be operational, but we noticed that there were some changes that needed to be made to them slightly. <clears throat> so we're proposing to amend the bylaws to um, define what a roll call vote is. I know that um, some of you are tired of saying yes <laughs> multiple times. So we are defining when a roll call vote is required. Um, some items are required for a roll call vote per state law, but there are other items that simply will require a voice vote. So we're defining those. We're also permitting a consent agenda. So items that are approved unanimously in the committees, um, most of them can be placed on the consent agenda so that it won't have to be discussed during the full board meeting. And then we are further defining the board committees um, to, to specify the composition, to specify that they are public and open, and to um, specify who can call meetings. So. Thank you, Danelle. Uh, you've heard Ms. I'm sorry, you've heard Ms. Whiteside's ex explanation regarding proposed amendments to the bylaws. Do we have a motion to adopt the proposed amendments to those bylaws? So moved. Second. Uh, the motion is moved by uh, Trustee Atkins and seconded by Trustee Jenkins. Uh, uh, is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the motion that you adopt the amendment to the bylaws. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Rayburn? Yes. Nine yeses. The amendment to the bylaws is adopted. At this time, I'd like to recognize President White to discuss the addition of an executive committee and the ratification of committee charters for the Business and Finance Committee, Academic Policies and Programs, Student Life Committee, and the Executive Committee. If you will remember, we approved a charter for the Audit Committee at the March 30th meeting. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so if you'll look at the information behind tab B, you'll see that we have included charters for the committees that you approved at your last meeting, and those charters just specify what the authorities and responsibilities will be, just so that each committee will know what it really has oversight of. And then there are certain action uh, actions or advice that needs to be given through the year that don't really fall within an existing committee. And so because of that, we've recommended that you establish an executive committee. And if you will look, the executive committee then would have the authority and responsibility to oversee uh, my annual evaluation and other presidential personnel matters, um, exercise powers and authority of the full board as needed between regular board meetings. Um, that would also be subject to limitations uh, that you are that you are imposing today. You would uh, periodically review bylaws and recommend necessary amendments to the bylaws, and then develop and implement a process for evaluating the effectiveness of the board and committee meetings. And so, um, the executive committee would really be almost a, a committee that would just kind of oversee the functioning of the board as well as the president's office. So we are recommending the executive committee to be composed of the board chair, the <coughs> vice chair, and one additional trustee is determined by the chair. And then the president would have an ex officio non-voting role as a member of that committee. And so we are offering these uh, for your review today. Uh, thank you, President White. You've heard President White's explanation for the executive committee and charters. Is there a motion that we approve the addition of an executive committee and ratify committee charters for the Business and Finance Committee, Academic Policies and Programs, Student Life Committee, and the Executive Committee? So moved. Uh, motion uh, by Trustee Carroll. Do I have a second? 
seconded by uh, Trustee Locke. Uh, it is moved and seconded that we approve the addition of an executive committee and ratify committee charters for the Business and Finance Committee, Academic Policies and Programs, Student Life Committee, and the Executive Committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on approving the addition of an executive committee and ratifying committee charters for the Business and Finance Committee, Academic Policies and Programs, Student Life Committee, and the Executive Committee. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins. Yes. Trustee Kanata. Mm -hmm. Yes. Trustee Carroll. Yes. Trustee Jenkins. Yes. Trustee Luck. Yes. Trustee May. Yes. Trustee Mueller. Yes. Trustee O'Malley. Yes. Trustee Rayburn. Yes. Nine yeses. Motion carries. At this time, I'd like to recognize Danelle Whiteside to discuss proposed changes to policy and adoption of rules. Thank you, Chairman. Um, at the last meeting, you all voted to approve the policy administration policy, which delegated um, the approval authority for policies in other areas except for policy administration, governance, organization policies. And there was a some recommendations for changes to this policy actually brought to us by Trustee Rayburn. And so we appreciate her for that feedback. Um, one of the things is there was an exception that allowed the president to make exceptions to this policy and we changed it to require disclosure to the board chair so that um, President White cannot make any exceptions to the policy administration policy without notifying the board. In addition, um, it changed the ability for the bringing of policy changes to the policy committee by the, it previously said the vice president for finance and administration, and it changed that to the policy committee chair. So those are the only two um, changes to that policy. And then do you want me to talk about the rules as well? Okay. Item C2, the student conduct and disciplinary sanctions rule. At the March 30 meeting, you all voted to adopt the student code of conduct policy, and that has to be promulgated into a rule. And so I'll briefly explain the rule promulgation process and why we need rules. Um, state entities are required to promulgate rules and regulations when the subject of those rules affects other parties' rights, the rights of third parties. And so you will see that there will be rules that are, that are brought before you periodically that have to go through the promulgation process, which means that once it's voted on by you, then I will file it with the Attorney General's office, um, which they do a review to make sure that it's legal that you can do this, and then I will file it with the Secretary of State's office. That allows the public 90 days to provide comment, and if they comment, then we can decide whether or not to incorporate those comments or not. And then it will go before the Government Operations Committee of the Tennessee General Assembly. And they are supposed to review that mostly for whether or not you have the statutory authority to adopt such a rule or regulation and to determine whether or not there is any fiscal impact to third parties. So basically this, this student code of conduct and disciplinary sanction rule mirrors the policy that you adopted at the last meeting and we're just putting that in rule format. And if you vote that uh, yes, then we will shepherd it through the promulgation process. Second, the traffic and parking regulations. Um, that rule was already in place, but because it was under the umbrella of TBR, we have to promulgate our own rule um, now so that it's going to go through that same process. Again, this is nothing new. It just needs to come out from under TBR's rules and pro be promulgated by the university. Thank you, Danelle. You just heard the explanations from Danelle Whiteside. Is there a motion to approve the changes to the policy administration policy? as well as to adopt the student conduct and disciplinary sanction and the traffic and parking regulations rule. I so move. Uh, motion by uh, Trustee Rayburn. Is there a second? Second. Yes. Second by Trustee May. It is moved and seconded that we approve the changes to the policy administration policy, as well as to adopt the student conduct and disciplinary sanction rule and the traffic and parking regulations rule. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on approval of the changes to the policy administration policy, as well as to adopt the student conduct and disciplinary sanction rule and the traffic and parking regulations rule. Secretary, please call the roll. 
Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Miller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Rayburn? Yes. Nine yeses. The motion carries. I'd now like to recognize Trustee Atkins, Chair of the Business and Finance Committee, to give us a report of their committee meeting <coughs> yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Business Finance Committee meeting yesterday afternoon uh, is my pleasure to present the report uh, to the full trustee board this morning. The committee reviewed and approved the following action items. Mandatory fee increases for the 2017-2018 academic year. Non-mandatory fee increases for the 2017-2018 academic year. Tuition increase for the 27-2018 academic year and funding for the estimated budget for the 2016-2017 physical year and the proposed budget for the 2017-2018 fiscal year. The above items will be presented for your review and action in a few minutes. The committee reviewed the following information items, changes to Austin Peay State University compensation plan. The plan establishes the methodology used by the university to offer market-based compensation to faculty and staff in a fair and equitable manner. Recent modifications to the compensation plan have occurred to create consistency for all employee groups at the university by using the same methodology for obtaining salary data for all employee groups. The proposed implementation, implementation plan date is July the 1st, 2017. Update on facilities, master plan revision. This item will be presented to you in a few minutes. Update on the capital outlay and maintenance process. Uh, later this month, uh, Tennessee Higher Education Commission will be sending documents to the administration of the university regarding the 2018-2019 capital budget request. At the September board meeting of the trustees, we will be reviewing and approving the list of capital outlay and maintenance projects for the university. Uh, Austin Peay State University is requesting a proposal from Jones Lane LaSalle, uh, JLL, through JLL's master contract with the State of Tennessee for custodial services. A proposal for grounds and building maintenance services will also be provided by JLL. An ad hoc campus committee will be assembled to review the proposals. Once they are received, a recommendation will be made to President White. The composite financial index consists of four ratios that are weighted and scored on a scale to create a single score of financial health for the university. The university's current composite financial index is 1.74. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report, and I move that the board approve the minutes of the May 18th Business Finance Committee meeting as written. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, motion is seconded by Trustee Carroll. It has been moved and seconded that we adopt the minutes of the Business and Finance Committee meeting. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes of the Business and Finance Committee meeting signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, minutes are approved. <clears throat> Trustee mm -hmm. Atkins report contained action items that we need to consider as a full board. Trustee Atkins, do you have a motion for us? Yes, we approved uh, the tuition increase for 2017-2018 academic year. You have before you a copy of the 2.85% tuition increase for the 2017-2018 academic year. By direction of the committee, I move to approve the 2.85% tuition increase for the 27-2018 academic year as written. We will take each motion separately. Because it is a motion of the committee, we do, we do not need a second. You've heard the motion on the proposed tuition increase. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the tuition increase is on. Uh, uh, hearing none, the question is on the tuition increase. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins. Yes. Trustee Canada. <clears throat> yes. Trustee Carroll. Yes. Trustee Jenkins. Yes. <clears throat> Trustee Luck. Yes. Trustee May. Yes. Trustee Miller. Yes. Trustee O'Malley. Yes. Trustee Rayburn. Yes. Nine yeses. 
You've heard the motion on the mandatory and non-mandatory. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Trustee Atkins. Okay, thanks. You got the floor. Uh, you trustees have before you a copy of the mandatory and non-mandatory fee increases for the 2017-2018 academic year. <clears throat> By direction of the committee, I move that the $56 increase to the program services fee and the rotor wing aviation program fees for 2017-2018 academic year uh, as written. You've heard the motion on the mandatory and non-mandatory fee increases. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chair, can I? Yes. Um, if I may, I have prepared a written statement of my remarks regarding the proposal to make sure that I convey all of the reasons why I believe that we as a board should deny the proposed athletic fee increase. I would like to first express my passion for wanting to do what is in the best interest of the university, even if it me means rejecting a proposal that is being presented to the board after it, it had been previously approved by all preceding authorities. My fellow board members, Athletic Director Ryan Ivey, as we know, has requested an annual increase of $50 to the current mandatory student athletics fee. Instead of paying $400 a year, the students would be, require, be required to pay $450 a year. This requires every student at the university to, to pay money to support a department that he or she may not be interested in, benefited by, or involved in. When compared to the overall tuition rate, an additional $50 makes up less than a 1% overall increase. But when compared to the fee itself, an additional $50 on top of $400 is actually a 12.5% increase. A 12.5% increase on this fee would provide the athletic department approximately $517,200 a year. My calculations come from the 10,344 students at Austin P enrolled in the 2016-2017 academic school year. As I am aware, there are fluctuations throughout the years on these numbers, so my calculations are rough estimates. Austin P is anticipating a larger enrollment for the up upcoming academic year, meaning that the number of students paying the fee would also increase. General Luck, at yesterday's meeting of the Business and Finance Committee, you asked Vice President Mitch Robinson why there was a marked increase of over $500,000 on the revenue side of the budget. The answer to which was given as being directly from the proposed athletics fee. It is in this vast difference in, in funding that I find my principal problem with this promo proposal. Director Ivey presented this proposal to the SGA earlier in the spring semester. At that meeting, he stated that the projected budget for the athletics department was $250,000, but the actual estimated expenditures would be $315,000. The deficit he presented was $65,000. As you can see, this is significantly less than what he's requesting. He would be re receiving about eight times more money than he presented to SGA that he needed. Vice President Robinson also noted that SGA voted to approve this proposal, but I believe that this should be taken with a grain of salt. At the time of the proposal, then President-elect Frank Burns suggested that the members of the Student Senate should go out and poll the students to get an idea of what their peers felt about the increase. Uh, I was surprised to read that only one senator took it upon himself and surveyed some students and found that unanim they unanimously did not support the increase. However, the Senate voted in favor for the increase. Current Chief Justice informed me a few days ago that it is not common for senators to survey the student body unless instructed by an executive order. While the internal workings of the SGA are neither pertinent to the board or under its purview, I do believe that for these reasons, I'm not sure that SGA has accurately expressed the voice of the student body in this matter. I can say with confidence, however, that every student that I have asked or that has approached me in regards to this, including an SGA member, has said that they do not want the increase and they fear it will be used in an abject way to bolster our football team. It is my firm belief that this board should deny this proposal with the intent of stating that if the athletic department wishes to obtain the additional funding it is seeking through a 12.5% increase of its mandatory fee, it should do it periodically over the next five to 10 years, as I do not see an immediate need for such a large increase now. That's all I have. Trustee Willenius, thanks for your passioned uh, commentary on the, on the motion. Um, is there any additional discussion? Hearing none, the question, oh, there is. Just a little feedback after committee meetings yesterday. So shout out to Crystal for sharing what she obviously feels very passionate <coughs> about. I think that's fantastic. Um, overall, I know that 
our fees at Austin P are second lowest of all of our comparable schools and the value students are getting are, I think what we believe close to top tier. So I think in the grand scheme of things, our fees might need to increase even more, not go down. That's just my comment, thank you. Thanks, Trustee Kanata. Any additional? Can I respond to that, sure. please? Uh, in regards to the mandatory student uh, athletic fee, it doesn't, each student that pays this is not benefited by this fee. So I understand where you're coming from, that we do have the lowest increases, but compared to the fee itself, that $50 to a student at Austin P who has student debt and loans who is not involved in the athletic department at all is a lot of money. So I would just like for the board to consider that when making their decision. Thank you. Any additional comments? I will say, if I can add, as chair of the committee, I did spend two half days with the business finance department with Mitch Robson's staff and looked at that very thoroughly about any increases on students. When you balance everything out and listen to business finance administration, I believe was justified in asking for the increase. So I think the business finance committee would stand on its proposal here, recommendation. Thank you, Trustee Atkins, for your comments. Any additional comments? Mr. Chair. Trustee uh, Willenius. <laughs> so one thing that uh, I fear as a board is that because things were previously approved by uh, preceding authorities, that <clears throat> it would be easier to just accept the proposal that we have now. It would, it would take more effort to revise those, but I think that, that we should consider doing what's in the best interest of the university overall and not just one section like the athletic department. And then I also want to just remind you that when the director proposed this to the Student Government Association, he had requested $65,000. So when the students overall each year are paying about half a million dollars, it doesn't add up. So I don't understand why director, uh, he was asking for $65,000, but he's receiving half a million. So that's excessively more than what he told SGA that he was paying for. So I, I'm not sure that SGA understood that when they voted yes for this. Yeah. I may defer to President White or Vice President Mitch Robinson for any comment. Actually, I was not in attendance to that at that meeting, but uh, Mr. Ryan Ivey was. Uh, he was the actual one that presented it, and I don't know if it would be appropriate for him well, to make any comments. I'd, ask, I'd invite Ryan to Athletic Director Ryan Ivey if he'd like to make a comment. So the, the comment that you're referring to is actually the event management <coughs> budget. It was not the total budget for the athletics department. Our current event management budget uh, for the year is roughly $250,000. So that has to do, do with all the event management costs that we have uh, from an athletics department. So officials fees, um, ticket takers, student works, anything that has to do with the event management. The projected budget for this year was a $350,000 uh, expenditure on that. So that's where the $65,000 deficit, that was part of one slide. Um, that was a part of a much larger presentation. So I don't know where, where that 65,000, because our budget for an athletics department is r roughly $10.5 million. So it's not, not $315,000. So that was just part of one, um, part of the present, the entire presentation on that. So I hope that clears up that aspect of it. So. So the, the 65,000 that I had uh, received that information from the Allstate, uh, that, that's the, the newspaper that Austin P has. So that's where I had gotten that information from. Uh, also, I, I, I wanna also bring up the fact that the athletes did re also receive this past year a brand new gym. And so I think that if the athletic department did want or need more scholarships and new offices and hiring uh, new people, why didn't they postpone building a brand new gym for the athletes when they could have used the FOI instead of giving them a brand new uh, gym that nobody besides them can use on campus? 
the the new weight room um, was part of um, the Forterra Stadium uh, funds that we got. So we that was, a, that was privately raised uh, for that aspect. That was, so that's why that was one of our critical needs uh, from a student athlete welf welfare standpoint. Um, our student athletes can't use the FOI um, at the times where they need to. Um, so our athletes have to have specific um, weight room, training room, those type of things to help from a student athlete welfare area. So that's why we um, chose to move forward with the, with, with the weight room project. And then also one more question. So for the, the student body as a whole, so I, I wanna, I'm sorry I, I'm talking so much, but I wanna remind the board that Austin P is very unique and very di diverse and that we have many non-traditional students and veterans that come to this school and honestly come to school after serving in the military to just get their degree and move on. So they're not interested in the athletic department, no offense. Um, I personally love the athletic department, support you go to every games, but as a whole, I don't, I'm not seeing a, a vast majority of support from the students. So what I would wanna know, speaking on behalf of, as a student here, how, how would you, how does this benefit this fee that we're all required to pay in it? Well, if it's passed, that we would be required to pay, how is this benefiting us? I'd, I'd like to address that if, if I could. Please. Thank you. Um, this is, you raise a really important philosophical question. And frankly, as a student, um, I had the very same questions and as a faculty member, in some cases, I had the same questions, and they're, and they're valid. The, the finance of the university, though, is such, when you're dealing with a budget that is, is roughly $140 million, and, and some of that's passed through, you know, for uh, financial aid and that kind of thing, but you're dealing with a budget, and you're dealing with a city that requires uh, people who may benefit peripherally to support <laughs> the functioning of that city. So for instance, my brother lives in Florida. A lot of seniors retire in Florida and they have no children, but they pay school taxes, even though they don't have any children attending school. But their communities are better served by having children who have good schools and who can be educated and join the workforce. We have fees on students that deal with the library, and I hope every student uses the library, but I know that's not the case. We support the Child Learning Center to support faculty and students who need to put their children in daycare, and it is not self-supporting, Now, and they have to pay. It's not free either. They pay a good amount, but we have a schedule that accommodates them that other daycare centers in Clarksville can't provide, but it will never stand on its own. So the university supplements that even though not all of our students or faculty or staff have children. And so when, uh, when you pay to, there are people who pay to use the FOI who never use the FOI. Um, they pay for amenities that we offer on campus that they personally don't use. But if you, if you only assign a charge on a per use basis, number one, we wouldn't have the amenities that we have as a university as a whole. whole. Number two, the way the, the infrastructure of the university is, and this is, this is kind of a tough thing, um, you're, in a way you're being taxed for something for the future. So it may be that the fees that you're paying now will go in an investment that students who follow you will reap. And some of the benefits that you enjoy now are benefits that were paid for by students who came before you who never reaped those benefits. And so I, I would like to say, wow, it would be nice to just pay for exactly this cafeteria approach where if I use that, I'll pay for it. And if I don't use it, I don't have to pay for it. The reality is we couldn't build the university that we have on that financial model. Um, but I don't disagree with your logic at all. And as one, one last thing, uh, I think getting input is valid. And I also agree that not just one student group represents the whole student body. But as a social science researcher, um, 
intercept interviews, talking to people in the FOI or talking to people in the UC is also not a scientific study. So you really wouldn't know what the student body believes unless there was a random sample generated and a survey conducted and a scientific analysis. So it's, it's just kind of the nature of, of research. Um, but I welcome your questions and I also think that you're showing you're showing an understanding of the fiduciary responsibility of the board, and I value that. President White, thank you. Uh, one thing I just want, wanted to comment to what you just said, I appreciate everything that you just said. Uh, I am not requesting that we pay no fees. I just, I think that a 12.5% increase on this mandatory fee is quite excessive, and I don't see how, why we couldn't have done a 2%, 10%, you know, 8% increase on this instead of jumping excessively to a 12.5% increase because in the future, I don't see this fee ever going back down. So doing this big jump, it's only ever going to go up from there. And I, and I fear that it's just going to excessively increase. And that was like a big uh, jump to start with. Can I ask, um, what's, the, what's been the history of, of this fee, when was the last time it was increased and by, and by how much, do you recall that? Uh, I, I really don't know that I have the information with me. I can look for it and reply back uh, in a minute, but uh, I believe it was about three years ago when it went up last and it went up, I, I believe by about $125 per year, if I remember correctly. Uh, it was used to satisfy primarily gender equity issues that we had on campus. Um, Title IX is a very expensive um, requirement for athletics and, and in fact part of the money as I understand for this increase will also go to address uh, gender equity issues that are, uh, need to be addressed over in the athletic department. Um, I and do we know are, that, we are not at liberty to ignore those issues, right? We are not. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, yes. I just wanted to point out to the group that the total mandatory fee increase is 3.8%, not 12%. One uh, line item is 12%, I, but in total it's only 3.8%. Yeah. yeah, I was comparing it to the, the $400 that students currently pay right now. So a $50 on top of that would have been a 12.5% increase. Right. It's under Section D3. Thank you, Trustee Willenius, for the uh, heartfelt debate and discussion. It's very help, healthy uh, for this board to have, so thank you. Any, any additional discussion on the mandatory or non-mandatory fees? Hearing none, Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. <coughs> Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee <coughs> Miller. Yes. Trustee O'Malley. Yes. Trustee Rayburn. Yes. Nine yeses. <coughs> Trustee right. Atkins. Uh, now we have the overview of the master planning process. In your binder, you have a copy of the proposal for Austin Peay State University's update to the facilities master plan. At this time, I'd like to recognize Mitch Robson, Vice President of Finance Administration, to give an overview of the facilities master plan revision. Point of order. Trustee Atkins, I think there were two more motions that you were supposed to be making. Were there? The operating budget and... That's it. Is that, okay, just the, the, just the operating <laughs> budget. D4. D4. I skipped the budget. Yes. I forget what I just said. <laughs> we'll back up. I was sitting there reading that, and I said, I think we just did that. So we'll back up to review and approval of funding for the estimated budget fiscal year 16-17 and proposed budget fiscal year 2017-2018. You have before you a copy of the estimated budget for the 2016-2017 fiscal year and the proposed budget for the 2017-28 fiscal year. By direction of the committee, I move to approve the estimated budget for the 2016-2017 fiscal year and proposed budget for the 2017-2018 fiscal year as written. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on 
approving the operating budget for 2017-18 uh, is on the table. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? <coughs> yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Rayburn? Yes. Nine yeses. Thank you. I'd like to now recognize Mitch Robinson, Vice President for Finance and Administration, to discuss the master planning process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just wanted to give you a quick little update on the master planning process, not uh, the facilities master planning process. Uh, um, every five years or so, the Tennessee Higher Education had a rule that uh, each institution would update and review their master plan. Uh, they are actually now changing those rules, or proposing a change to those rules, to that that would be only be every 10 years. But every two years would require a check to make sure that significant changes had not occurred at the institution, such as a board governance change, or perhaps a large acquisition of property, or even perhaps the hiring of a new president. As you know, we are currently in the process of updating our facilities master plan. We've engaged the services of uh, a master planning company that's Dober Linsky Mathy out of Massachusetts. Uh, the principal there is Art Litsky. He's well-known master planner across the country. He's done a number, number of master plans here in Tennessee. And uh, we are very fortunate to be able to use him again in leading us through this process. Uh, the material that was sent out to you uh, has basically the process that they are going through in order to do an update to this master plan. The first step is a review of the mission, vision, and planning assumptions. The second step is an assessment and analysis. Third step is a definition of needs. The fourth is a con concept plan development. And finally, the fifth is the actual presentation of the APSU master plan. There is a preliminary schedule that is included in your information, and that includes uh, each of the steps. We are right now smack dab in the middle of it. Uh, we hope that at our next board meeting in September that we will have a presentation to you uh, by Mr. Artlinski uh, regarding the concept plan development, and then by November, December, we hope to have the complete master plan ready for your review and approval at the December board meeting. Uh, once that's approved, then it will go to the Tennessee Higher Education Commission for their approval. And then finally, it will go to the State Building Commission for their approval. And we hope to have that all completed uh, by this spring, uh, maybe January, February. Uh, that's my report. Any questions? What Mitch has just presented is for informational purposes only and does not require a vote. So thank you, Mitch, for your report. I appreciate it. I'd now like to recognize Trustee Jenkins, Chair of the Academic Policies and Programs Student Life Committee, to give us a report of the committee meeting yesterday. Thank you for the opportunity to present my report from yesterday's Academic Programs Policies Student Affairs Board Committee meeting. The committee reviewed the following information items. Intent to submit letter of notification to the Tennessee Higher Education Committee to establish doctoral program, Doctor of Psychology degree in Counseling Psychology. Austin P. intends to submit a letter of notification to THEC to develop a Doctor of Psychology degree in Counseling Psychology. The proposed program will seek to provide a doctoral level curriculum to prepare graduates to provide mental and behavioral health services to the general population with an option to focus on providing that assistance to service members, their families, and veterans by completing a military health services concentration. Uh, we were really pleased about the, uh, the military connection on this program. American Psychological Association has identified the need for professional psychologists trained to work with military populations as priority the proposed program seeks to train health service psychologists to help address this national shortage. The university is uniquely well positioned to address this need given its long standing relationship with Fort Campbell. Also, we looked at development of an accelerated master's pathways. 
Austin P plans to support accelerated master's pathways, allowing high achieving students to enroll in graduate level courses while still pursuing undergraduate degrees. Qualified students, these are typically are classified as seniors with GPA of 3.5 or higher, would be able to seek permission to enroll in no more than 12 graduate level credits while completing an undergraduate degree. Also, we consider revision to entrance exam expectations and regulation for all graduate programs. Programs that use entrance exams and their admission deliberations will establish entrance exam expectations and therefore not use entrance exam minimums. Each graduate program may choose to establish stricter admission standards, such as entrance exam minimums due to the program accreditation requirements. We also had revision to the graduate fresh start regulation for all graduate students. This is a new regulation allowing graduate students to enter a graduate program without postgraduate credit for non-related graduate programs to be used in GPA calculations. Graduate Fresh Start Regulation enhances the efficiency of university processes by preventing the automatic probation or suspension of graduate students who are performing well in the new program. And uh, lastly, the revision to graduate honors regulation for all graduate students. This is a regulation modification to limit the GPA impacts of credits earned from unrelated graduate courses on the GPA calculations used to determine honor status of graduating graduate students. Graduate honors is determined by a minimum cumulative GPA of 3.85 within a graduate program and excludes those grades to earn outside of the graduate program. Uh, our committee reviewed and approved the following action items, tenure approvals, promotion approvals, tenure upon appointment, uh, Dean Prentice Chandler to the Martha Dickerson Erickson College of Education, new graduate certificate in professional education research at the Martha Dickerson Erickson College of Education, and new graduate certificate in data science from the College of Science and Mathematics. The above items will be presented for review and action after the approval of board committee minutes. As committee chair, I also entertain new business items. Uh, Trustee Wallenis asked if Austin Peace calendar could be altered so that spring break aligns with Clarkson Montgomery County school system. President White indicated the university's calendar was overseen in the past by TBR and the university can now consider this for future years and we all thought this was an excellent recommendation. Uh, Trustee Wallenis also asked about her ability to talk to student groups about issues prior to board meetings. President White advised Trustee Wallenini so that she could contact Vice President Cheryl Bird regarding which student group to contact, such as Student Government Association. That concludes my report. I move that the Board approve the minutes of the May 18th Academic Programs and Policies Student Affairs Board Committee as written. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by Trustee Luck. Uh, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt the minutes of the Academic Policies and Programs Student Life Committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes of the Business and Finance Committee of the Academic Policies and Programs Student Life Committee, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> minutes are approved. <coughs> Trustee Jenkins' report contained action items that we need to consider as a full board. Trustee Jenkins, do you have a motion for us? Yes, uh, <clears throat> per university policy, the president recommends the granting of tenure to eligible faculty mem members within the requirements of Austin P policies on tenure. A total of 17 faculty members are recommended for tenure in fall 2017. The list of faculty members recommended is provided in your binder. By direction of the committee, I move to approve the list of faculty recommended for tenure as written. Second. Don, you just, you just made a motion on the approval of tenure policy? Yes. yes. No, 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 on tenure itself. No. Did we do on the granting policy? tenure for the It's granting tenure for the state. <clears throat> You can take that one, he, and then he can make the, mo the next motion be about the policy. Yeah. We'll take each motion separately? Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, you've heard the motion on the approval of tenure policy? No, on the tenure list. On the tenure list, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. 
So you've heard the motion on the, the approval of the policy for tenure, the list. The list of, the list of individuals. That were candidates for tenure. Right. Yes. Uh, is there any discussion regarding that list? Hearing none, the question on the tenure list approval uh, is on the, on the table. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? <clears throat> yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Rayburn? Yes. Nine yeses. Don, back to you on the tenure policy is next. Okay. Um, yeah, before you a copy of the recommendation to award tenure upon appointment to the new Martha Dickerson Erickson College of Education, Dean Prentice Chandler, scheduled to begin employment on July 1st, 2017. Dr. Chandler's education as well as teaching scholarship and service experience meet the tenure criteria of the College of Education. Therefore, the Martha Dickerson Erickson College of Education recommends that Dr. <coughs> Chandler be appointed with tenure at the rank of full professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning. You've heard the motion on the approval of tenure upon appointment of Dr. Prentice Chandler. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the approval of, of Dr. Prentice Chandler receiving tenure upon his appointment. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? <coughs> Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Rayburn? Yes. Nine yeses. I think, Don, we need to go back and approve the tenure policy. We have not done that one okay. yet. Okay. You have a copy of the list of faculty recommending. Oh. I don't think I had that. <clears throat> if you'll turn to E2 in your binder. Okay, on uh, E2, I would make a motion that we uh, advocate uh, tenure for these professors. Is that what we need? We're going to approve the tenure policy. Policy, sorry. Dr. Gandhi, do you want to give us a brief on the tenure policy before we go ahead with this vote? Well, it, it didn't go through the committee yesterday, so I'm, I'm not was not considered at the committee meeting yesterday. I, th I thought because it's a policy, just the full board would vote on it. But I, I would defer to the secretary. Do you, would you like to talk about the tenure policy? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I can, there's a long story of, of how this uh, got here. Uh, originally, we picked certain <coughs> policies to be uh, approved by the board. I think that, uh, we ended up, because we have hundreds of policies. They're broken up into a uh, kind of high level, and we ended up uh, starting all those with a zero. And then there's academic policies. Uh, start with another number, I think a two, et cetera. So originally the tenure policy, uh, we had it under the twos. And only, uh, am I getting that right, or is it ones? Governance policy. What well, they start with? Zero. Zero. So only the zeros came to the board, and uh, but we were advised uh, <clears throat> by somebody who actually read the Focus Act that that tenure policy has to be under the board. So that's why this is coming to y'all. It's basically the same tenure policy we've always had. So it's just really an organizational who has to approve it issue. Could I speak to this as well? So we, we talked a little bit in the committee about the difference in tenure and promotion last, last time. And so one of the things, I just wanted to give you a preview of what we're thinking for the future. 
the Focus Act vests tenure with the board. So you have statutory authority to grant tenure and you cannot delegate that. So right now our policies uh, indicate that you will approve tenure and promotion recommendations. At your next meeting, or one of, one of, it may not be your next meeting, but sometime this, sometime this year, we're gonna be working internally on a promotion policy that would change a little bit. We would continue to bring tenure cases to the board, but we would no longer bring promotion cases. And primarily, as I mentioned yesterday, promotion has to do with um, levels of achievement that fit criteria associated with assistant, associate, and full <coughs> professor ranks. And even though some of you are academics around the table, many of you are not, most of you are not, and because promotion does not uh, really be that, it's not that commitment to each other that tenure is that we discussed yesterday, uh, we are going to propose going forward that you continue to approve tenure cases, but that you would delegate the promotion cases uh, to the campus, culminating with my decision, which of course then could be appealed to you, um, just as many things can be appealed to you. And so this policy that you have before you really just takes the tenure policy that we have now, brings it out of TBR, make sure that you've got oversight of it. But the other reason I wanted to speak to it is, is I still believe that the campus has a lot of work to do. So you will get this policy over and over as the campus tries to, um, as I have asked them to simplify it. And the reason I believe it needs to be simplified is that I have to follow it when there's an appeal or when I'm making a recommendation. And if I have to read it several times, to really make sure I'm following policy, I think it needs to be simplified. Of course, it could speak something to, about me. But, you know, what our campus has tried to do on, on the right side is to put in a lot of, well, what if this happens? Or what if this situation is there? And when you write to those more exceptional situations, it clouds the policy. And so I just wanted to give you a heads up that after you, if you approve this today, you're going to see it a number of times because the faculty are going to work over a period of time to simplify the policy. And it will take probably a couple of years actually. So I'm just saying please um, <coughs> consider what we bring to you today, but know that this is not a one and done. We'll be bringing it as the campus has an opportunity to work on it. I just wanted to, to clarify that one thing that did happen in the committee meeting yesterday was that the provost did present to us a, uh, uh, a brief summary of the, the levels of the process for uh, <coughs> personnel, for faculty, and that, is in the, that discussion uh, is in the minutes of our, of our committee meeting. Yep. Thank you. So based on the discussions that were held yesterday in the committee meeting, and uh, in today's session, I'll make a motion that we approve the tenure policy as discussed. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Trustee Mueller. Um, and because I guess we need to have a, uh, a, a voice vote or a roll call vote. Okay, any discussion prior to the vote? Hearing none, Secretary, please call a roll. Trustee Atkins. Yes. Trustee Kanata. Yes. Trustee Carroll. Yes. Trustee Jenkins. Yes. Trustee Luck. Yes. Trustee May. Yes. Trustee Miller. Yes. Trustee O'Malley. Yes. Trustee Rayburn. Yes. Nine yeses. Thank you. And Don, I guess you're now at the graduate certificate okay. spot. <clears throat> yeah, before you, the information regarding proposed graduate certificate in professional education research in the Martha Dickerson Erickson College of Education. Proposed program consists of 18 <coughs> graduate hours in education research focusing on statistics, qualitative and quantitative research methods, and action research. The target audience for this program is the faculty of the University of Curaçao. That's a uh, Dutch island. 
<clears throat> off of, uh, I think, South America, whose administration desires to provide access to graduate level education research instruction to support the academic and scholarly endeavors of its faculty and enhance their academic qualifications. By direction of the committee, I move to approve a new graduate certificate in professional education research. So you've heard the, the motion on the approval of a graduate certificate in professional education research. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the approval of a graduate certificate in professional education research is on the table. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Rayburn? Yes. Nine yeses. And Don? Okay, you have before you the information regarding a proposed graduate certificate in data science in the College of Science and Mathematics. This proposed program consists of 18 graduate hours in statistics and data management focusing on modern methods of collection, handling, storage, analysis, interpretation, and present presentation of data. The target audience for this program is working professionals in need of these skills, but who do not wish to pursue an entire Master of Science or Professional Science Master's degree in predictive analysis or data management and analysis. I move that we approve a new graduate certificate in data science. You've heard the motion on the approval of a graduate certificate in data science. Uh, and I, I hear a second from Trustee Luck. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the approval of a graduate certificate in data science uh, is on the table. Please call the rolls. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Rayburn? Yes. Nine yeses. Thank you. I'd now like to recognize Trustee Kanata, Chair of the Audit Committee, to give us a report of the committee meeting yesterday. Thank you. We had a very exciting and awesome Audit Committee meeting yesterday. The agenda and what we went over included a few action items. We approved the internal audit charter. We approved the internal audit policy. We approved the reporting fraud, waste, and abuse policy. We also approved the 2017 internal audit plan. We also had several informational items presented. We were informed on the Comptroller's Office Financial and Compliance Audit Report for 2016. We were informed on the Quality Assurance Review and several internal, inter, internal review results for May 2016. We were informed on the Internal Audit Customer Satisfaction Survey, which was great. Thank you, Blaine. The internal audit reports were issued in 2017, along with a list of outstanding audit recommendations. And we also had an educational session. I move that we approve the minutes of the audit committee meeting held on May 18th. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, the motion is seconded by Trustee Jenkins. It has been moved and seconded that we adopt the minutes of the audit committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes of the audit committee signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Minutes are approved. Trustee Kanata, are there any additional items for the full board to consider? No, there are not. Thank you very much. Point um, of order. Um, we do need to go back and make a vote on the promotion list that was not made in the academic. Hmm. Apparently we did tenure, but not promotion. Okay, uh, you have before you a copy of the list of faculty recommended for promotion. The university policy the present recommend is granting promotions to eligible faculty members within the firm. I'm sorry, of APSU policies on promotion. A total of 19 faculty members are recommended for promotion in fall 2017. By direction of the committee, I move to approve the list of faculty recommended for promotion as written. 
Thank you, Don. You've heard the motion on the approval of those individuals seeking promotion. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on approving the individual seeking promotion is on the table. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Rayburn? Yes. Nine yeses. Thank you. Thanks for keeping us on the straight and narrow. Yeah. Sorry we got off track there. Team effort. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize Derek Vandermeer, Vice President for Advancement, Communication, and Strategic Initiatives to discuss the naming of club level at Forterra Stadium. Hello, hello, here we go. All right, I'm catching up. Um, we're working with an outside corporate sponsor uh, to name, uh, the, to rename uh, the club level at the football stadium. And we had uh, formed a committee, and the committee is making a recommendation for that naming. It's a multi-year corporate sponsorship agreement, working with our outside agency that's helping us to secure those corporate sponsorship agreements. And we recommend the naming of the club. I have the, uh, it's like, is it G? So it, there we go. 10-year um, sponsorship agreement with Echo Power Engineering valued at $575,000. And they will be making uh, annual payments on that for a 10-year period of time. Uh, this is consistent with the naming of Fort Terra Stadium, uh, which occurred a year ago. Uh, for 2.5 million and just give Ryan Ivey a lot of credit for looking for other corporate sponsorship agreements that he can bring to the table uh, to help to continue to grow uh, funding for the athletics department. Thank you, Derek. Uh, you've heard the explanations from Derek Vandermeer. Is there a motion to approve changing the name from the club level at Fort Terra Stadium to the Echo Power club level? I move. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Kanata moves with a second by Trustee Luck. Um, it is moved and seconded that we approve changing the name from the club level at Fort Terra Stadium to Echo Power club level. Any discussion? Now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Vandermeer just a little bit about the company. Mm -hmm. Is it a national company, global, local? Exactly what they do, kind of thing. Just to know something about them, I appreciate their sponsorship. Okay, I, uh, I'm going to ask Ryan to give it. that full background because he secured the agreement. Um, okay. I'm uh, I'm aware that they are a local company, um, and you know, one of the things. Just while Ryan's walking up here, it's been very exciting to see. You know, we talk about the role that athletics can play in a university and its connect connection to the community. Um, what we've seen in the last few years is whether it's, and we'll talk a little bit about strategic planning and community focus, is we have increased uh, private sponsorship and private dollars um, as the visibility and the economic benefit back to the community occurs. Um, we have seen the Forterra come in with the 2.5 million. We've seen fundraising increase. We've seen a lot of residual benefits um, based upon visibility and community engagement and making a community a partner. And this is an agreement um, that um, I think reflects that perfectly, is that we are continuing to see large corporate partners step forward and really value the position and the growth of the university. Ryan. So Echo Power uh, Engineering is a firm owned by Joe and Kathy Maynard. Uh, not re in, no relation to the Maynards here in, in Clarksville, but um, they're a regional um, engineering firm where they do a lot of uh, building engineering, architecture, those type of things um, throughout the Middle Tennessee area. Primarily focus on they focus on a lot of um, healthcare um, areas. Um, they have some um, uh, they have an agreement with HCA right now where they do a lot of their. Um, engineering for buildings and things of that nature so a very uh, an up-and-coming they've been around i think for the last 15 years or so um, and they're continuing to move forward with that i know i met 
them at the athletic banquet, uh, but didn't get a chance to talk to them to find out anything about them. I knew they supported the athletic banquet the other night very well, but didn't get to find out really anything about them. It was such a crowd there, so uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion? Thank you, Billy. Uh, hearing none, the question on approving the change, changing the name from the club level at Forterra Stadium to Echo Power Club level. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Derek. Ryan. At this time, I'd like to recognize President White to provide background on the contract for President Emeritus Sherry Hoppy. Thank you, Chairman. So you have behind <clears throat> tab H a copy of a contract <clears throat> that was executed uh, by the Tennessee Board of Regents. Uh, it has been executed for the last 10 years. So there, there was a retirement benefit at the time that President Hoppe uh, began her tenure at Austin P. That really was a, re it was a retirement benefit that allowed for a uh, president to be named a president emeritus and carry with it um, a financial stipend along with uh, responsibilities. Actually, at the time she was hired, I don't believe the responsibilities were required. It was just a financial benefit. And then the, the state law policies uh, <coughs> impacting that arrangement changed when she was here. And so by the time she retired, the presidents in that, those categories were expected to render services to the university annually. And you have seen her at a lot of events at Austin P. She often travels from Chattanooga, attends events. Uh, she will often travel back the same night, which I've advised her not to do that over the mountain. But you know, there is a benefit to the university. She has helped us with alumni events in Chattanooga and alumni. She, you know, when you are a president of a university with a, an alumni group as large as Austin P you have an ab ability to form really deep relationships with people who love the school. And so I have really benefited by getting to know a lot of alumni, and I hope that I will carry those relationships forward uh, when I retire. I will tell you that the state law, the policies have changed, and even though every university in the TBR system have contracts like these, this is our only one, and at the time that, mm -hmm. that this contract ends with President Hoppy, there are no more. So this is, this is uh, something that is no longer uh, in policy. But my point is I will continue those relationships with people that I've developed uh, relationships with, friendships with, because we share a common love for Austin P. President Hoppy made some very valuable relationships with alumni across uh, the southeastern United States particularly. And there are times that I can't go to events and I have asked her to go and represent me. And so she has been to Florida, she has been to South Carolina, she has been to Atlanta. She, she really is a great ambassador for those uh, folks to, to keep up with what's going on at Austin P. So she attends events, she counsels uh, in some cases professionals that she worked for when she was, that worked with her rather when she was here, and she provides a lot of assistance. She also is willing to do anything that we would ask her to do. So I am happy to recommend that you continue the contract that was um, initiated by Tennessee Board of Regents. I will say one other thing. Typically the uh, president is at one institution for 10 years to become eligible. President Hoppy was eligible uh, after being here seven years because she was in the state system for a number of years before and it's something that was negotiated upon hire. So this is something that she was promised when she began at Austin P. I I believe in 2000 or 2001. Thank you, Dr. White. You heard the uh, recommendation from President White regarding approval of Dr. Hoppe's contract. Is there a motion to approve Dr. Hoppe's 2017-18 contract? So moved. Motion by Trustee Atkins. Is there a second? Second by Trustee Jenkins. It is moved and seconded that we approve Dr. Hoppe's 2017-2018 contract. Any discussion? Hearing none, the question on Dr. Hoppe's 2017-18 contract. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. At this time, I'd like to recognize President White again to give her a report and also to report on any interim items. OK, 
Okay, I have, I have uh, a couple of things that I want you to see today, and I'm going to start with uh, Derek Vandermeer. We mentioned at the last meeting, your first meeting, that the university had gone through a, a very, uh, it was a stressful, in-depth, uh, all-inclusive, a lot of data points, uh, strategic planning process. And you have a copy of the strategic plan in front of you and that was included in your notebook. But I asked Vice President for Advancement, Communication and Strategic Initiatives, Derek Vandermeer, to give you an idea of the process so that you would understand, number one, that it's not something that we can do in my office. It's not something that you should do as a board to just say do this, but it really needs to be something with a lot of input from stakeholders internal to campus and external to campus with input from the board, administration, and, and going forward, we will continue to adapt the strategic plan based on new information, new opportunities. So Derek Vandermeer, please. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm, you know, it's a great honor to be at Austin Peay State University and uh, coming into this role, I would say the most amazing process I've been a part of um, professionally has been the strategic planning process. Our student trustee noted how diverse our campus community is and it is um, one of our greatest challenges but it's also one of our greatest assets, the diversity of our campus community. And diversity is framed by military, it's non-traditional students, it's traditional undergraduate students, it's all of this, this different um, hybrid of the types of individuals that come into this community and it reflects this community so well. Um, going into this process, and I'm going to introduce uh, the, the complete process to you, but I want to make sure that you have the strategic planning booklet in front of you because I'm going to reference this at different points during the course of this presentation. Um, early on, uh, when President White came in, I remember uh, sitting with her at a basketball game as she was uh, contemplating this quote for a, uh, for a speech that she was giving. And, um, you know, I, I think that this quote really does capture the essence of how um, she feels, but how our campus community feels. When you go out and we were doing strategic planning and talking to faculty and students, um, people get very excited about Austin P. They get very excited about our brand. And I just was doing a leadership retreat with Tanova this morning, and we were talking about what brand means. And, and the marks and you know the, the graphics and the coloration is not the brand, the brand is the people. And the people define the purpose of the institution. Um, I would say President White, um, in her leadership style, has not come in and said, this is the purpose of Austin P. this is where we're going. Um, that brand and purpose of what Austin P is has been defined by the people of this institution through the strategic planning process. And so the quote to, to, to guide us was, transformation occurs when potential that is visible to some becomes visible to all. Um, this process is ongoing. It, it, doesn't, it didn't end with the publication of this book because we're, we're subject to people and people can sometimes be fickle and can some have to analyze direction and purpose and constantly get their hands around that. But this is the process that we went through to help us define who we are as an institution and the impact that we want to make in our community and region and state. So here's just a brief overview. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, but it started in 2014 from the moment that President White walked into this university. The first thing that she wanted to do was an overview of our strengths, weaknesses, and our opportunities as an institution. Uh, 2015, we started with a series of surveys. Uh, right now, you can see uh, under five, we are um, in a, a period of metric um, gathering and development. We'll talk about metrics here in a little bit. Uh, and then we have ongoing implementation and action plan development, which has been going on throughout the, the, the course of this process, all with helping us to define what this means to our campus community and what critical decisions are gonna have to be made in the next uh, one to two years that's gonna impact outcome. Now, I'm gonna tell you something, that um, you have become a critical part of our strategic planning moving forward. Your vision, your passion, your love for Austin P is part of that story that needs to be told um, as we begin to communicate our, our brand and our position to our entire campus community and to our region. So on page 10 and 11, you can see an illustration of exactly the process. And, and I'll only reference that, and we'll move on and have you look at it at a later time. So in 2014, as I noted, uh, President White arrived and immediately said, let's uh, let's complete an assessment of our campus community and see what we see as our strengths. Let's reveal what our people feel about the organization and what our opportunities are. Our strengths were we are a high quality experience for student institution. And I think that that is driven by faculty that are passionate, that care. 
um, that invest in the lives of our students. I think it's a reflection of our student body as well and the diversity that we bring as a campus community. Uh, you can sit in the classroom and be sitting next to a student that has um, had multiple tours um, in military and, and their feedback and, and what they give to the other student. I say you learn more from your peers sometimes than you learn uh, from, from uh, the, you know, what you're learning in the classroom. And, and I think that that has created a great quality experience for our students in this community positive campus environment, uh, genuinely staff and faculty that are committed to our student populations and are willing to serve um, in student success support. Opportunity, we were the best kept secret. Um, that's not, you know, it's, it's great to be in a community, but being a best kept secret is, is not, it's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, we want to be, everybody to know th that we're a gem in Clarksville. We had had a couple years of enrollment decline. Uh, leading to this assessment, um, and that was concerning as to why that enrollment decline was happening, and um, the forecasting of what is it going to take to change that from a marketing and PR standpoint, from a communication standpoint as well. Um, we have been languid in new program development, so the emphasis on how we're going to meet the needs of our workforce and our community and region became very important. Um, you see the governor's commitment to drive to 55. You see the growth of Nashville and our MSA and how it's impacting workforce in our entire region. Uh, having an opportunity to go around in, in, in all 10 counties, you can see the, desperate, the desperation that there is in um, continuing to train a workforce that's ready for the growing economy and the growing businesses in our region. And then community relationships. Um, how do we get past College Street and in integrate with our community and make the business community a partner in our growth? Because universities cannot grow on their own. If we don't have alumni and donors and we don't have a business community that's rallying to help us, uh, we fail. Great example of that was Dwayne Estes's presentation this morning. If you look at that list, um, Dwayne Estes has a great vision. Uh, he's part of our strategic plan as a university of what we can become a regional leader that's highly respected by uh, foundations and organizations and businesses. Unfortunately, if you're not telling that story and you don't have the vehicles to tell that story, you don't get the partnerships. And what's been amazing, what has transformed Austin P is that we've broken that barrier in our community. And now as I take Dwayne Estes around the country and we, we've been to Washington DC and Texas Cattle Ranch. Uh, Texas cattle ranches and we're talking about his initiative people are learning about who we are as an institution today he's actually I was supposed to be with him um, and I'm, I'm here speaking but we, there's a cattlemen's association meeting in Kentucky and we have the uh, National Akuishia Association in town and we're talking about how to commercialize some of this grass-fed initiative that he is uh, proposing uh, with farmers in our region amazing partnerships but it happens because we're telling the story of Austin P State University so that's that's why I'm so passionate about this branding element. Um, knowledge. Uh, the concerns that we had that were quickly identified was resource allocation, efficient processes, uh, communication strategies internal and external to the university, uh, recruitment, compensation, and that's why compensation has been identified as one of the number one priorities in our strategic planning process. We immediately went to our campus community and we tried to define our high level uh, values uh, from what do we want to be identified as an institution to what were the values that were going to guide us and to the um, to the right corner of the screen, you start to see the development of this leading through excellence. And this, this brand position has developed. But leading through excellence, the, the excellence is not the critical word. There, and we've used that throughout all of our publications. But we, we found a campus that was, very, uh, that was very proud of being leaders and wanted to aspire to be even larger regional and state leaders and even uh, national leaders in its brand position. So leading through became our um, a slogan that uh, pulled us through. On the internal part of that, uh, you see uh, the values, the core values, and, and these were, this was an early rendition, but if you look in your book on page nine, you see a more to fully developed model where leading through is the driver, but you see student success, enrollment, communication, sustainability, and diversity as being our primary goal areas driven by the core values of quality, innovation, collaboration, community, and globalization. And each one of those values are very critical in our identity moving forward and what we aspire to be as an institution. On nine, each of those value sets are clearly communicated. And then on subsequent pages of this document, you start to see each, um, each um, goal clearly communicated from enrollment growth, on page 12 to student success, goal two on page 16, 
on page 20, sustainability. So as we grow and we improve our overall student success, so we don't want to grow just to grow. We want the quality of our student population to, to be significantly enhanced. We've already seen significant improvement um, in that area as well the quality of our campus community, and then sustaining it with infrastructure growth, master planning support to support that growth. Then uh, on go uh, goal four on page 24 is diversity of our campus population. And this diversity continues to encompass all the different types of populations that we believe make us strong as an institution. And then on goal, uh, goal five, communication, branding, and strategic planning. And that's page 28. That's telling the story of Austin P to our alumni, to our fans, to our supporters, to our community, to our business leaders, and making sure that we're an outward-facing institution that's looking at uh, regional and state partnerships and national partnerships to help us grow and become the institution we believe that we are. So once we've defined that value set and that goal direction, we took another dive in which is considered an action planning phase. We are looking to define a series of action plans that help us achieve each one of the bulleted points below. Um, you can see on goal five, uh, discussion about building partnerships with government, military, nonprofit, educational, business, and other entities that enhance APSU mission. Um, communicate strong strategic focus for planning. You see all those different things, and each one of those is being supported by action plans that talks about the direction and each step that we're going to take as an institution to achieve these objectives. And this is referring back to the strategic planning and those core values. And now we're in a phase of, uh, of draft, and I just want to talk about the drafting process. We have 12 different drafts that we work through in completion of the plan. We had town hall meetings where we shared this to our campus community, Try to feed, uh, had a feedback loop, making sure that we're getting constant feedback. We have a steering team that includes deans, uh, vice presidents, and other staff members across campus that are continuing to review. Um, as I noted early on, we're in the metric determination phase, and we have a meeting uh, later this month to talk about the definition of all those metrics, because much, uh, much like many of you in your industries, you have to have those key KPIs that you're monitoring all the time to ensure your fulfillment of your strategic plan. Uh, this is a, just an indication of the action planning process, uh, the form that's used to help us uh, monitor and diagram the steps that we're going to use to achieve our goals and objectives, the dashboards that are in the process of being development, and the board will start seeing this into the future. And moving forward with closing out our strategic planning process. And one of the things I'll say before I'll show this video is strategic planning is never done. Uh, this is a constant engagement. Um, our, my, my number one objective is this plan will never sit on a shelf. It is, it is part of everything we do as an institution, every discussion. Our values guide us and challenge us each and every day and become an important fixture in how we think about the growth of this institution. Our directional growth into our downtown area is, is part of Austin P, but it's also part of how we see Austin P becoming a, a, a leader in transforming the Clarksville community. And by transforming the Clarksville community, we support the types of students that we recruit to this institution. We believe fundamentally that the relationship between those is a very important part of our brand and what we are as a traditional college campus. We want to become a traditional college town, and we want our students that come here to have a great experience. So all these other features of our development become critical to our student experience and enhance the future of Austin P. I'm going to close with this video. Austin P State University's Leading Through Excellence strategic plan is now ready to transform our institution. Why? Because we live in the second fastest growing economic region in the country with hundreds of young and international newcomers arriving each month. This influx of new arrivals is changing the industrial and economic context of our area. And the regional growth demands that more Tennesseans have advanced degrees to meet the needs of potential employers. Governor Haslam's Drive to 55 initiative and the recently passed Focus Act have changed the state's higher education landscape. Last year, we examined how Austin P could continue to thrive in this new environment. With the involvement of faculty, staff, and the community, we've developed our 10-year strategic plan to meet that challenge. The five goals you identified form the heart of the plan, and completion of these goals will strengthen the institution over the next 10 years. Our first goal is to increase enrollment to 13,000 students by 2020, and to 15,000 students by 2025. This year, with our largest freshman class ever of more than 1,900 students, we're taking an important first step toward achieving that objective. Goal 2 seeks to expand the opportunities available to our students. 
And after working with the John N. Gardner Institute and developing a student success committee, we are becoming more focused on helping students successfully navigate their college careers. The third goal calls for us to build a campus that can sustain 15,000 students. And we're doing that through the purchase of new property and updates to the campus's master plan. Our fourth goal focuses on expanding diversity at Austin P to meet the needs of the region's shifting population and to enrich our students' lives. The recent creation of a chief diversity officer and an expansion of cultural programs, Austin P will continue to embrace this diverse campus. The fifth goal seeks to broaden the university's reputation in the region and the country through increased communication and branding efforts. In a few months, you'll see a new APSU webpage that will help us share Austin P's story with the world. A team of senior leaders will guide us through the challenges in this dynamic environment. Strategic plans don't transform institutions, people do. Together, we created these goals, and together, we'll make them a reality. This year, let's all work together to ensure that Austin P remains a transformative place for generations to come. Uh, just in closing, I would like to acknowledge Catherine Bailey. Uh, she is my partner in this crime of strategic planning, uh, but she is an invaluable asset who has worked tirelessly to help make this a reality, and um, I just want to thank her for all of her work that she's done on this plan. So thank you. So I asked Derek to, to make half of my presentation, and the other one is going to be on government relations. The, the government uh, the uh, legislature just finished its session last week, and there are a few items that impact the university, and I ask our uh, assistant uh, to the president for community and government relations, Carol Clark, to make a presentation just on things that affect us. But as she's coming up, uh, you'll notice that Tucker Brown, Dr. Brown, uh, was listed in the video. He was the narrator. He was faculty senate president last year, and the senate just elected a new president for this coming year, and I'd like for uh, Barry Jones to stand and be recognized as the new faculty senate president. And at the same time, I, I want to recognize Austin P's strong commitment to shared governance. And this really is the best environment I've ever seen in terms of shared governance. It doesn't mean that one group gets to, by consensus, make a decision or by a democratic process, but it does mean that the university recognizes the significant intellectual capital on campus. And if you have that significant intellectual capital, why in the world wouldn't you tap into it and find the experts to really talk about things that they know and see uh, from a vantage point that others don't? And so uh, that was a really big benefit to me to come here because of the culture that was here. And I'm really uh, happy that we have that culture on campus. And so, uh, Carol Clark, if you'll give us a, a quick update on what happened in the session and how it impacts us. Thank you, President White, and good morning again, trustees. Um, there were a number of bills that passed in the General Assembly this year that impact higher education. We have chosen to focus on six that um, directly impact your action as Board of Trustee members or that have opportunities for the university that you will be addressing in some manner in the future. The first two bills are bills that will at some point in the future require or permit board action um, in a manner that has not been uh, given to the um, institutional, the state governing boards in the past. The first is an, a bill that addresses immunization requirements for higher ed students. That has been an area that has been problematic for many of our institutions when it comes to working with um, the existing guidance and requirements for immunizations. And in short, what that bill does is it transfers rulemaking authority from THEC to the Institutional Governing Board and will require the governing boards, such as Austin P, in consultation with the Department of Health to promulgate rules regarding immunization requirements for enrolled students. And I know that um, Ms. Whiteside has already addressed the rulemaking process, and this is something that will likely be coming before you for consideration in the near future. Um, it does give the board more authority than the structure that was previously in place. The second bill that will require board action is being referred to as the Campus Free Speech Protection Act. 
And this bill requires governing bodies of every institution to adopt a policy that affirms 17 principles of free speech. Those are incorporated into the bill. It is a of particular interest to note that the bill specifically prohibits the restriction of students' free speech to particular areas of the campus, which we have commonly referred to as free speech zones. So this will require some changes to our existing policies, and that bill will take effect January 1st, 2018. So there will be some action required between now and then. The next three bills are bills that will ultimately present opportunities for Austin P as we seek to reach those enrollment targets. The first bill is referred to as the Strong Act, and that is a bill that establishes a pilot program to provide Tennessee National Guard members with last dollar funding similar to uh, Tennessee Promise in the way that funding is applied toward a bachelor's degree at any regionally accredited university college or community college or private college or university that has its primary campus in Tennessee. So we will definitely have the opportunity to um, do some recruiting from that segment of students. We do not have a definite start date on that. We do expect it to um, permit enrollments this fall, but the reason we don't have a start date is because the Adjutant General of Tennessee has to promulgate the rules regarding what students need to do to be accepted into that program. But that is a great opportunity for Austin P. And the people with the National Guard who work with that are excited about it. They've already been in contact with us about how can we work together to offer those opportunities to Tennessee students. The second act is a VETS Act update, and VETS is Veterans Education Transition Support Act. And uh, there are several provisions of that, too, that are particularly noteworthy, is that the bill requires state institutions to work together to develop consistent methods of applying credit for military training, experience, and so forth. And it establishes a mechanism for the universities to work together on, on that project. There's another provision that takes effect imminently and does have some opportunity for Austin P. And this is to keep Tennessee in compliance with some existing federal laws. And it grants in-state tuition to anyone using veterans educational benefits, whether that individual is a veteran or a family member who has been assigned those benefits, enrolling at any public institution in the state of Tennessee, and living in the state regardless of the individual's formal state of residency or official home of record. What that does for us is it streamlines some decision-making process and clarifies some things. That takes effect July 1st, 2017. So we do look to see that um, impact some students who would be coming in the fall, and there will be probably some changes to some of our in-state tuition procedures and policies. The third bill is called the Tennessee Reconnect Bill. This is a bill that's similar to Tennessee Promise, and it establishes a last dollar tuition scholarship for independent adult students who are Tennessee residents in the amount of the average cost of tuition and mandatory fees at community colleges. So it's applied similar to um, the uh, Tennessee Promise. It becomes effective in 2018, and there will be some details worked out with that, I'm sure, over time. That, of course, contributes greatly to the governor and the state's drive to 55 to increase the number of Tennesseans who are ready for our workforce needs in the future. The final item is an informational item. Um, it is a modification to the FOCUS Act that allows a member of a state university board to also serve on the governing board of a private institution of higher education, but not another public institution. And when I checked last night, this bill has been passed by both houses of the General Assembly, and it was waiting for the signature of the House Speaker. So there are still a few steps in the process before that becomes final. Um, those are some of the keynotes, highlights of the General Assembly session, and I would be happy to answer questions if appropriate at this time. Are there any questions on this part of my report? 
Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And so uh, the other part of this part of the agenda, the other piece, is giving you a report on interim items. And if you look at the second B and your tabs, there's just a list of contracts that have uh, been approved over $10,000 by me. And so seven are expenses and three are revenue contracts. And you'll just notice that some are, were competitively awarded, some not. Those that were not competitively awarded just mean that there was some something that they offered that made it a sole source type of contract. They were the only ones who could provide a certain um, benefit to the university. And so all of those contracts followed state procurement guidelines, and those are for your information only. And that, can conclude, that concludes my report. Outstanding. Thank you very much, Dr. White. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize Mitch Robinson, Vice President for Finance and Administration, to give an update on the university's organizational chart and review of amended <coughs> compensation plan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, in your materials, there's an organizational chart of the institution. I'd like to just uh, very quickly go over that with you and see if you have any questions. Uh, but of course, you're at the top, uh, as, it, as it should be. And uh, you can see all of the grand divisions of the institution and how we operate here as a team to make the things happen at Austin P. And I do want to draw your attention to two changes this time that were made in the academic affairs area. There's a title change for the assist assistant provost and vice president for academic affairs to the vice provost and associate vice president for academic affairs. And the second change is the addition of a direct report within academic affairs for the director of extended and international education. Those are the only two changes in the organizational chart and I would certainly ask if you have any questions. As we continue to learn the lay of the land here at Austin P, is it possible, Mitch, to get uh, on the organizational chart names of the actual folks that fill those slots as well? Absolutely. Cool. We will do that. Thanks. And one clarification, too. Uh, you'll note that the auditor reports directly to the board with a dotted line to me. Mm -hmm. And so that also is an update. Okay, the next uh, informational item for to, to discuss is the review of the Austin P. State University Compensation Plan. I provided some information to the uh, Finance Committee yesterday on that plan. And let me, there we go. The major change to the compensation plan that uh, you see today is how uh, we treat all of our different employee classes here at Austin P in terms of determining their market values. Uh, for example, our faculty, our administrators, and our, and our uh, professional staff, we use cer certain data from the College and University Professionals Association to determine the appropriate market medians. Uh, for our support staff, we were under the Tennessee Board of Regents and they were very prescriptive on position titles for our support staff and also how the medians were determined and associated with certain skill level ranges. What we have done is actually made a change to where we're treating all employee groups the same and we're using the COOPA, the College and University Personnel Administration information to identify titles, uh, position descriptions, and market values for all of those groups. Uh, I might also say that uh, uh, in cases where the new market data was lower than the market data used for compensation increases last year, uh, we are holding harmless all of those employees. So uh, last year's market data will be used in cases uh, where the new data is lower. Um, the university has a strategic planning goal that uh, Vice President Vandermeer uh, shared with you in terms of, of sustainability. And part of that sustainability goal, we do have one goal that is to enhance compensation planning for quality 
growth, and longevity. In order to achieve that goal, uh, we have as our number one funding priority for this year is to bring faculty and staff salaries up to the appropriate market levels. The university, as you know, invested a significant amount of resources last year to cover what turned out to be approximately one third of that gap between what our employees are paid and what the appropriate market levels are. With the funds that we have allocated for salary adjustments this year, the university will close that gap even further. And of course, the ultimate goal is to pay our employees the median for each position and certainly then move to a compensation strategy that is based primarily on performance. Mr. Chairman, that's my report on the compensation plan. Any questions? Thank you very much, Mitch. Good report. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize President White to discuss the master calendar of board items. <clears throat> this is really also just an FYI, so if you will look at tab E, <clears throat> there is a master calendar that's so that you can plan and, and look to see how business is done. Some of those are spread out through the year just for convenience of how decisions are made with various groups on <clears throat> campus. Some follow uh, THEC and TBR requirements. They have to get certain data by certain times so that they can also vote on some of the things that impact us. Remember, TBR still will have to approve our operating budget for surety purposes before it goes to THEC. What I wanted to mention to you, though, is that uh, you have a great deal to say with the business that's done here. And so anything that I just invite you and encourage you, I read, a, I read an article this week about curiosity. And curiosity is really a friend of a board of trustees. And there could be things that we do that you have no idea why we do them. And you may ask that we just include a report on that or, or talk to you a little bit about how decisions are made or why we did something. And in some cases, I think what we can do is satisfy you that we are doing our best with the responsibilities that you've given us. In other cases, you will convince us that there's a better way to do things. And so I encourage you to look at the calendar, see what might be missing, and then, of course, discuss with Chairman O'Malley um, things that might be candidates to be included in future board meetings. Thank you. I'm curious, George's brother, Gary, curious, Gary. <laughs> Yes. Uh, when you're looking at uh, tab E okay. and the board master calendar, we this morning approved another committee, didn't we? <clears throat> yes. Okay. And where, where does that fit in this? So that, that is, so what we're finding are gaps. And if you have a gap, if, if we discover a gap, we'll handle that at the next meeting. When, at the time this master calendar was put together, we didn't know we had a gap. And so, if let's say that you determine that, that you would like to propose another committee going forward, because when you decided on the committee structure at the first board meeting, it was decided that you would have the least number of required committees and then as you determined that you wanted to maybe uh, take on another initiative, you would either ask for an ad hoc committee or another standing committee. So it's my understanding that if you decided that there was something that was missing, you would ask Chairman O'Malley to present that at the next uh, board meeting. And so if it's not on the master calendar, it can come up at any time. <coughs> If it's not on here, it doesn't mean that it can't be added. So the committee kind of squeegees in between these other committees, anything that might... Right, because not... the, these are mostly recurring. Not mm -hmm. everything, but mostly recurring. There will be other things that would be board business that would not be recurring. And so you would just add those as needed. Does that make sense? I reckon it does to most people in here. I'm having a little trouble with it right now, but I'll be okay. The, the other one, the other Curious George question was, uh, we list here the council. I, are, you are, aren't you the council? Yes. Uh, then we might, we got in here, the, I was just looking at it, I, I'll go back to it in a minute, but where it lists the council uh, of that last. Uh, On the org chart? Yes. Okay. Uh, it doesn't list. Uh, 
now. Oh, I'm on there. Huh? You said it did not list me. No, I I, I see that, but but the the one before that, the page before that, which I can't find right now. Bless my heart again. Uh, it lists uh, some. It's not important enough to. Uh, I'll come back to you with it. But later, you are correct. Way. That is that should have been listed as a change. Okay. Because that is a change. So before we had a university attorney who reported to me with a dotted line to Tennessee Board of Regents, and okay. now we have a general counsel who reports to me with a dotted line to the Board of Trustees. Cool. Okay. Uh, Thanks, President White. Uh, in in regard to uh, to General Luck's previous question, um, the um, the executive committee mm -hmm. that that doesn't necessarily meet regularly, right? That as part as part of this process, that meets as needed. Right. That's kind of why it exists. Okay. Right. I would look at it as a cleanup catch all committee. And so what we what we were thinking about when we looked at how some others were structured too is is if you don't have an exhaustive committee list, you'll have a few things right. that don't fit neatly. If you have a completely exhaustive committee list, you have many more committees. And so this is a way to streamline the board operation where most of the most of the things are handled by the audit committee, the business and finance committee, the academic slash student affairs committee. But there are a few things that don't fit neatly into any of those and an executive committee can kind of pick those up as needed. Then as you go forward, if you decide you want more committees, you can add them. But that's one that doesn't necessarily fit a defined portfolio. It is kind of a cleanup. Thank you. Can I be addressed because I found it. All right, sure. It's, yeah. it's <laughs> a, under tab D, page four. And it's under the senior leadership and it lists the university council as Stephanie Reavers. This this particular document was created last year, so that's the members of the 2015-16 doesn't compensation ad hoc okay. ad hoc committee. So this is a historical document. Okay, no. right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we adjourn, yes, we're about to adjourn. Um, I just wanted to say that <clears throat> I think I share with my fellow trustees a, uh, a real sense of privilege in serving on the board after our second, really our first full meeting. Um, it's, uh, we're learning, I think most of us anyway, are learning a whole lot more than we ever thought we would know about the operation, <laughs> the challenges, and the opportunities of running a great university, so thank you. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to Dr. White, uh, to Donnell Whiteside, uh, to Carol Clark, to all the staff, everybody that had a hand in putting the meeting together, uh, to include the audiovisual team, you guys did a great job. Um, and special thanks to uh, uh, Blaine, to Dr. Gandy, and to Mitch Robinson for your help with the committees and your participation yesterday. Um, and and to Penny get, Howard. Uh, Penny, Penny Howard's Howard. been taking Penny, minutes thank you. and put our notebooks together and probably hasn't slept in about two weeks. Thank you, Penny. Um, so with that, I officially move that the uh, board adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by, enthusiastically seconded, I might add, by Trustee Adkins. We have another life, you know. It, it is moved <laughs> and seconded that the meeting adjourn. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Meeting's adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>